Was it ever possible for the Soviet Union to win the Cold War? Looking back, its defeat seemed inevitable. It had a political system that was hated by much of its population, not to mention those in its client states, part of the reason why anti-communist movements like Solidarity in Poland moved so quickly. The Soviet Union also had a backwards economy, and harsh geographic conditions made development challenging. It didn't have the fertile growing conditions and river network of the United States, for example. But as late as the 1980s, few people thought that the Soviet Union would fall apart as quickly and catastrophically as it did. We're going to explore this question in this episode. Was the Soviet Union structurally doomed to fail? From the onset, was it impossible to avoid? Or could better internal management and perhaps more strategic blunders from the United States brought the Soviet Union victory? How close was the USSR to victory in the Cold War? To explore this alternate reality and level of possibility is Dr. Robert Farley, today's guest. He's a professor of security and diplomacy at the University of Kentucky and author of the book Patents for Power, Intellectual Property Law, and the Diffusion of Military Technology. This episode is part of our ongoing podcast series where we're looking at the plans that were drawn up by losing powers in a war. For example, what was the Confederacy planning on doing after it had won the Civil War? What did Nazi Germany want to do with Eastern Europe after it had won World War II? And as you can imagine, the plans were horrific. They wanted to depopulate and ethnically cleanse the land of its Slavic population and replace it with Aryans. How did Alexander the Great want to remake the Eastern Mediterranean in his image after he returned from his campaign of conquest in Central Asia and India? So with that in mind, we're going to look at the Cold War in this episode of this series. We're going to put ourselves in the place of those who were there during the Cold War when few people thought that American victory was inevitable. Instead, they thought that U.S. survival depended on investments in cutting-edge technology like Star Wars that could shoot nuclear ICBMs out of the sky, along with extensive interventions across the globe with Korea and Vietnam only being the most visible examples. Finally, we're going to look at what the Soviet Union possibly would have done if it had won the Cold War. What would victory look like for the Soviets, defeat for the United States, and how would the Soviet Union still exist in the 21st century? Would it become more technologically advanced and evolve along the lines of a China, or would it become backwards and isolationist and belligerent like North Korea? We'll explore all of that and more, so I hope you enjoy this episode with Dr. Robert Farley. Before we get into the counterfactuals, Let's get into the big picture and take a look at the main factors that caused Russia to lose the Cold War. There's significant argument about what these are, but from your perspective, having studied this from a foreign policy perspective, what were the main factors that led to the downfall and dissolution of the Soviet Union? So I'm going to take two coward's ways out here before we start. The first one is that I'm a political scientist, not a historian, and my specialization isn't really in the collapse of the Soviet Union, but I'm more of a generalist who does approach this from a foreign policy side. And the second coward's way out is it's really, really complicated. So part of the answer here, I think part of the answer that everybody agrees with is that the collapse of the Soviet Union had a lot to do with the fact that it was unable to hold its nationalisms together. So the Soviet Union was an empire in the classic sense in that uh, it was essentially a metropolitan state that ruled lots of different territories with lots of different organizing principles. And so you had sort of the parts of the Russian Federation that were part of Russia, you had the uh, Soviet republics, and then you had essentially the outlying parts of the empire, which were the Eastern European satellite states. And by the 1980s, there were lots and lots of rumblings in lots of these places that there were significant problems with Soviet rule. I think we're pretty familiar with what happened in Poland in 1980. There were similar nationalist movements in Hungary, in Czechoslovakia. Yugoslavia wasn't really a satellite state, but it was part of the same, ran into a lot of the same problems around the same time. You also have essentially ethnic nationalist, ethnic leaders emerging in places like Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, the Baltic states, and to some extent even in Ukraine, that were really seeking a lot more autonomy from uh, the Soviet Union. And you even had places in Russia itself, and the, the most familiar that we're one, the one that we have here is Chechnya, where you had people, you know, ten, five, ten years before the Soviet Union collapsed, essentially saying that that we need to we need to rethink this model, right? This imperial model. And so that's one part of it. And I think by the nineteen eighties that combined with with two other factors that just created a lot of problems for the Soviet Empire. And these were connected. The first was the general uncompetitiveness of the Soviet economy. Right. So you had, especially on the technology and consumer goods, 
you had a, a lot slower growth than what you saw in the West. And this was obscured by a lot of the different ways that we do stats. The Soviet economy looked fine in, say, the 1960s, but it's producing stuff that is not technology intensive. And that's, that's not really competitive with the sort of the way that productivity is taking off in the West. And related to this is the fact that the Soviet military and the Soviet defense circles begin to notice in the early 1980s that they have both a short-term and a long-term military problem. And the short-term military problem is that uh, NATO and the United States are deploying some pretty lethal uh, combinations of nuclear weapons in Western Europe that are an immediate threat at decapitation of the Soviet leadership. Now, Americans will say, we never intended to launch a first strike on the Soviet Union. And the Soviets are going to say, yeah, we're going to trust that. But so the Soviets really became to be worried about the military balance in the early 1980s. And they were also, also thinking in Soviet military affairs that this was going to be a long-term problem because Soviet military thinkers could look at the state of the computer industry in Western Europe and they could look at the computer industry in the United States and then they could look at what they had and they could say like, look, you know, they are going to integrate this technology into their military establishments and we cannot keep up with them, right? I mean, fundamentally... We may not be in a serious problem today, but five years from now, 10 years from now, NATO is going to have a significant conventional advantage over this just because of their ways of integrating technology. And this, you know, created a sense of crisis in the Soviet leadership, but it also changed the relationship between the Soviet Union and the satellite states. Because now, instead of organizing all the satellite states into this what would have been a spectacular and well-planned offensive into Western Europe, where everybody had their thing, they kind of let the satellites go their own way. And once the satellites started going their own way, they became less afraid of Soviet intervention, and that helps decay the empire. And so I think basically all three of those things came together. There are other things going on. Human rights is a thing. General economic problems are a thing. But I think those are the three biggest that, that you know, the Soviets lacked the technology. They were extremely worried about their military power. And this helped lead to a situation in which they were just not capable of dealing with the growth of nationalism in a lot of different parts of the empire. You've highlighted a lot of important reasons why the Soviet Union lost the Cold War. There are so many structural disadvantages it has from a political standpoint, trying to unite many different ethnic groups together from a resource standpoint, from a technological standpoint. And it's easy to look back and think that there's simply no way they could have won. And some have argued that the victory of the United States goes back basically 100 million years with its geographic advantage, that it's protected with oceans on two sides. It has fertile ground. It has a river network that enables easy commerce that Russia lacks. But that's not the case, at least for those at the time period, when it was never really considered absolutely inevitable or foregone conclusion the Soviet Union would collapse. And I've heard some say that the low part, the low point for the United States was in the late 60s, early 1970s, when nations in Africa and Latin America, like Nicaragua, are joining the communist bloc. They're political and intellectual elites that are voicing their preference for Moscow and Beijing over Washington and London. The non-aligned world is siding with the communist bloc at the United Nations. So with that in mind, for those people at the time, victory was never a foregone conclusion. Was defeat for the Soviet Union completely inevitable, or were there scenarios in which the U.S. and Britain and the NATO alliance could have lost? So, I mean, I don't think we ever see something sort of on the Soviet side that is as spectacular a victory in the Cold War as uh, the United States and NATO won, right? So there is not a path here to imagining a United States that collapses into its constituent parts. So we have the Republic of Texas and the Republic of California in the same way that the Soviet Union did. But I think that when we're, when we're talking about what a Soviet victory in the Cold War would look like, you know, essentially what we're talking about is a breakup of the Western alliance, right? Because, you know, you got to look in for, for the bulk of the Cold War, the United States has a pretty firm grip on all of the most important technological and industrial areas of the planet, right? And so this is the most productive parts of Germany. It is the, you know, a, a, a essentially the, the industrial space that runs from northern Italy through southern England. It is Japan. Um, and the United States has a pretty firm grip on the industrial, uh, all part of the big alliance, but, you know, alliance has some coercion to it. And the United States and Great Britain also have a, have a pretty firm grip on the oil producing regions of the world. 
Now, obviously, a rock bounces back and forth, and Iran eventually is going to bounce back and forth. But the U.S. Uh, and British you know, sort of ability to access petroleum and the inability of the Soviet Union to cut off petroleum is also pretty critical to, to how the West is winning this war. And so if we're looking at, you know, how does America lose? I think, you know, we need to start with, OK, how does the Soviet Union break up some of those advantages? You know, one one part is lost pretty early on, a fight that the Soviets lose pretty early on, which is over who's going to control France and Italy. And in the late 1940s, this was an open question as to whether France and Italy might move communist, but just for domestic reasons, because their domestic politics were both pretty complicated. And so there's a space where you might see big parts of Europe detached from the Soviets. I don't think that anybody really thought that the United States and Japan were going to remain as tight as they were from 1945 on. You could have potentially seen certain kinds of revolutions in the Arab world or maybe an earlier revolution in Iran that went communist rather than Islamic that also sort of undercut American and British global power. But I think when you're saying, what does it mean for the Soviet Union to win? What you really mean is, what is it that cracks open the Western alliance and prevents the United States from maintaining the hegemonic position that it had in 1945? And the answer to that is, you know, affect domestic developments in France, Italy, Japan, and the Arab world, and maybe you can flip things around. You know, the Africa and Latin America, you know, the United States thought that they were pretty important, important at the time, but from an economic and strategic point of view, it's, it's mostly small potatoes, right? The big ones are, are, are Japan the Middle East and, and Central Europe. Let's dive deeper into some of these what-if scenarios. This is where the fun part starts. How could you think the USSR have specifically shattered the NATO alliance? I mean, do they steal the better scientists that eventually go to the US in Operation Paperclip from Nazi Germany and the USSR gets Werner von Braun? Do they uh, manage to coerce Turkey to join their side so that Russia has access through the Bosphorus Straits, and it can send its nuclear submarines into the Mediterranean and beyond. Do they, I don't know, develop some super weapon, all these different types of wargaming scenarios that people love to look at? So what do you think could have been things that would have shattered the NATO alliance? Yeah, that's a really great question. You know, about Operation Paperclip, there's a lot of really good work on that now, that, that Operation Paperclip did help, or the Soviets' version of Operation Paperclip was was fairly productive for the Soviet economy, although although not really as productive as people say. But it, it was not a big deal with respect to uh, the United States. So we expected it to be about a lot more. That the press it got was a lot more. But but that in fact the U.S. economy, on like just about every metric, was so far more advanced than the German economy in 1945. That what we picked up from the Germans wasn't wasn't really all that big of a deal. There's a, what is a book called Taking Nazi Technology. I think Doug Copeland is the author. It's really it's really fantastic. So, you know, I mean, in addition to the aforementioned stuff like, you know, try to bring France in, try to win the political battle of Italy, but the Russians tried that pretty hard and they lost. You know, try to bring, try to neutralize Germany is the other big one, but, but the Americans and the British and the French have a pretty strong grip on Italy. You know, with respect to things like deterring or, or uh, coercing Turkey, the problem, you know, the reason that Turkey became part of NATO was because the, the Soviets were being coercive, right? That they were threatening the Turks. And that's almost always, just as we're seeing right now with fin Finland and Sweden, that's almost always the response when, when the Soviets or the Russians get active is that people move in the other direction. You know, and this, this one is a little bit, a little bit off the, off the, out of the box thinking, but you know, I mean, at some point, the Soviets might have just gone ahead and called the basic fundamental NATO bluff, which is that the United States is going to respond with nuclear weapons to a conventional attack on Germany. And I know that that sounds pretty aggressive from the Soviet point of view, but the NATO war plans from the 1950s and the 1960s are basically, all right, boys, we're going to turn and run to the English Channel and hope that we get there before the Russians do. And that's, that's basically British and French and Dutch and American strategy from the 1950s and the 1960s. And so, you know, the idea that, you know, if the Soviets had been a little bit more risk acceptant, I mean, let's be frank, a lot more risk acceptant, had been a lot more uh, aggressive with respect to Berlin and perhaps a little bit more pushy in other parts, that it might have had people in NATO asking, like, look, are the Americans really going to show up? when the Russians start messing with stuff and, and heck, do we want the Americans to show up, right? Because, you know, we would rather live in a world where there's no NATO 
than one in which the United States has just destroyed basically everything with its nuclear weapons. And so, you know, in a sense, I mean, that's, that's one of the ways that I can kind of imagine, or one of the only ways that I can imagine the Soviets turning this around is actually being more aggressive, being more risk acceptant, and sort of bringing to a head the basic contradictions that are at the heart of NATO, which is that, you know, we want to save NATO through nuclear weapons, but Europe doesn't want nuclear weapons used on it. Well, it's a good thing that we didn't have to test out how far the doctrine of mutually assured destruction goes and if people are going to keep up their end of the bargain. It doesn't sound like there's a lot of scenarios where the Soviet Union is winning this in ways that are overall a net positive for humanity, which is why it's good to explore this. Another factor, too, I wonder is if it could have been possible for the USSR to prevent its economic stagnation. And this really gets into what people talk about the structural disadvantages that, yes, the Soviet Union has incredible access to oil reserves and natural resources, which Russia still does today and is playing out in its uh, blackmailing of Europe in the Ukraine conflict. But at the same time, it simply doesn't have access to both the natural resources that those in the NATO sphere do. And in terms of better technology, you can really only send so many spies to steal secrets from others. You can't steal a manufacturing base if you want to. And geographic challenges, a cold, harsh climate makes economic development more difficult. You're limited by population numbers in different ways. There's all sorts of things that go into it. But what were these sorts of economic challenges that the USSR had? And do you think they were doing the absolute best with the hand they were dealt? Or could they have done better? Yeah, I mean, I, so I think that you can look at sort of the course of Soviet economic development. You can point at a lot of places where, you know, here are some pretty dramatic inefficiencies. Here are some pretty significant problems. Their political system is misdirecting investment, putting money and resources in the wrong place. They are overspending on the military by a pretty substantial margin. And this is having a sort of bad systemic effects on the rest of the economy. But you know what? You could look at a lot of countries and say, oh, you know, this country messed up. This country did badly. Here's a critical uh, economic error that this country made and so forth. I mean, I think that the Soviet Union really had, and I think here that the comparison with China is really instructive, right? Because, you know, you can look at China and say, look, you have an even more controlled, even more primitive economy that from 1980 on really takes off. Why couldn't the Soviets just have borrowed or do something that was like what uh, the Chinese communists did and create, uh, you know, a thriving, technologically efficient economy? And I think there are a couple answers to that question. The first is that, you know, there's a lot of stuff that the Soviets could have done to make their domestic economy more dynamic. And this, I think, is like a legitimate own goal in the Soviet system that, you know, they just have this really sclerotic, both industrial and agricultural system that, you know, just runs, runs well beyond the place where more inputs are useful for more productivity. And you can look and say, like, look, if you loosen this up in the way that kind of the Yugoslavs loosened it up or the way that Dung loosened it up or even the way that Tito loosened things up, because, you know, honestly, the Yugoslav economy was doing OK on some of these metrics, too, then you can you can see a Soviet economy that's a little bit more productive than the one that actually happened. But the second part of that, the second part of the, the Chinese success, you know, is not just that the Chinese system could accept lots and lots of foreign investment. Foreign investment is a problem in the Soviet system, both because, well, for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons being that the Soviets didn't want to give power up to foreign investors. And this was, you know, a major problem. And the Chinese had this problem too, but they got over it. But, you know, it's that the United States led essentially an entire system, a global system of essentially boycotting significant technological export to the Soviet Union, boycotting significant, the transfer of significant engineering knowledge, significant scientific knowledge. This thing today where we have, you know, we in the United States talk about thousands, what are we doing with these many thousands, dozens of thousands of Chinese scientists and Chinese students who are living and working in the United States, and some of them go back to China, some of them stay here. Like, that didn't happen in the Cold War. Right. We didn't bring Soviet students to the United States and send them through our best engineering schools because it was like, well, if you know, the Soviets come here and learn stuff, then they'll take that back and put it as part of their economy. Right. 
And so that's the reason the Soviets had to steal stuff, because we engaged in a really concerted effort to make sure that the Soviet community, the Soviet economy was as closed off from international technological development as it possibly could be. And that's absolutely something that we did not do to the Chinese in the 1980s and the 1990s and the 2000s, with the result that the Chinese had access to lots of different uh, technologies that could drive economic growth domestically, but that also could make them pretty competitive with respect to the export of manufacturing goods. And the Soviets, they the Soviets just didn't have that option because we had so much leverage with the Japanese and the Western Europeans that we could essentially close off even Western Europe and Japan from being accessed by people in the Soviet Union who really wanted advanced technology. And so, so the Soviets had to continuously reinvent the wheel, right? And it wasn't just, we reinvented the wheel, everything's okay now. It's like, we have to reinvent the next wheel. Right. We have to reinvent the axle and then we have to reinvent the suspension system because their system of technology could never really keep up with the Western one because the Western one was so big. Right. It was Western Europe and North America and the most industrially important parts of Asia. And that was just a lot bigger than the Soviets had access to. And the Soviets didn't have a good way around that. And so, you know, I think there, there are steps that the Soviet leadership could have taken to make their economy more productive, more receptive to more open, more receptive to consumer needs. But, you know, the United States was leaning pretty hard on uh, the Soviets and, and, and really everyone to prevent them from doing that. Scott here. We're going to have a very short word from our sponsors. But first, I want to give a shout out to all the great shows on the Parthenon Podcast Network, including History of the Papacy. You can find this and many other great shows at ParthenonPodcast.com. I'm curious what NATO defeat in the Cold War would look like. First, let's look at this from the perspective of the USSR, how they envisioned this happening. There were plans for this, famously Nikita Khrushchev pounding on the podium that we will bury you, although I've read many people say that that's a mistranslation. He's more saying we will outlast you. He's not calling for direct confrontation via thermonuclear war, rather through this Cold War process, he'll that their system will simply prove superior over a long enough period of time and more people will join their alliance. From the Soviet perspective, did they just simply imagine that dominoes would continue to fall, more people would switch to a communist economic system, join their military alliance, and that would spread across the globe? Or from what you've researched, do they imagine something else? No, I mean, I think you're, I, I don't know about the, I mean, the geographical spread, I think, is part of it. But, you know, especially early in the Cold War, but even fairly late, you know, the, the people in the Soviet Union, the leadership of the Soviet Union, they believed a lot of stuff about sort of Marxist theory and the Marxist theories of history. And so this idea that, you know, on the one hand, Western capitalist society is riven by a whole set of different really glaring contradictions, class contradictions, race contradictions, that in the long run simply cannot be smoothed over and are going to come out continuously into the open and are going to be ever more damaging. The Western alliance system is riven by exactly the same kinds of contradictions because the British want something different than the French, want something different than the Germans, want something different than the Japanese, want something different than the Americans. You know, those contradictions are going to come into the open. You know, we just fought World War II over those contradictions. So how can we imagine the Americans holding that together? And I think that, that the Soviets, and the Soviets are not alone in this, the Soviets really kind of overstated the importance of Western economic penetration and Western economic control, neocolonialism in Africa and Latin America, that, you know, with the exception of oil, which was the absolutely critical commodity, it was pretty easy for the Western alliance to be able to deal with any kind of specific problem. You know, if so, say Chile joins, Chile goes leftist and it's hard to get copper. Well, you can source copper from somewhere else or you can replace the copper with something else. You know, it's not like how Lenin said, where every bit of Western prosperity is built upon exploitation of the third world, right? That certainly happens and it's relevant, but most of Western prosperity is actually based on technological transformation in, in major capitalist societies rather than resource productivity and capturing resources from the developing world. And so I think that the Soviets kind of messed that up. But yeah, I mean, 
And and there there are times at which you can look at American society and not just American, right? If you're sitting in 1968 and you're looking at what's happening in France and what's happening in Britain and what's happening in the United States, it really seems like the West is just on the verge of falling apart. Right. It really seems like the political systems in the West are just not able to handle all of the different kind of catastrophic strains that they're being put under. And I don't think that the Soviets really at this time thought, I mean, they certainly understood, lots of Soviet technocrats understood that there were economic problems with the Soviet Union that had to be remedied. But I don't think they generally thought that they were fatal. Right. They thought that, oh, you know, look, we'll resolve this, but at least we're not the Americans who have, you know, a dozen cities going under flame in 1968, and that's a major problem. So, yeah, I think that the Soviets, you know, really kind of thought that they would just outlast the West, that their system maybe wasn't as productive in some ways, but it was going to be enduring, and that, you know, eventually between Western powers and within specific Western countries, you were going to have contradictions that really sort of sapped Western strength. You touched on earlier about what the loss of the Cold War in the United States would look like. And you noted that the dissolution of the United States into its separate states simply wouldn't happen in the same way that the Soviet Union falls apart into Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, etc. But what do you think it would look like? And there's all sorts of fiction that have explored this question from extreme angles like Mad Max, where there's a post-apocalyptic nuclear wasteland where we're driving around in hot rods with flamethrowing guitars. Others have had a more moderate take. I remember, I think there's a 90s television show called Sliders, where this group traveled to parallel universes, and one of them, the Soviet Union, wins the Cold War. And it's simply the script flipped in which the resources of the United States shrink while those of the Soviet Union grow, and the model of communism supersedes Western democracy. What do you think it would look like? Let's take the specific case of the United States if it lost the Cold War. So I think that a, that, a, that a U.S. loss in the Cold War, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick my guns and say that we're, we're not looking at a collapse of the American system, right? What the American system domestically, right? What we're looking at is the collapse of the international system that the United States created around it from 1945 on. And so then, yeah, you know, like you start there and you work your way backwards. And so, you know, you're looking at a United States, which is coexistent with a bunch of other major powers where you you know you still have some european countries with with that are substantially powerful but that are not aligned with the united states you probably have a japan which is powerful but not aligned with the united states you don't have the united states with the kind of leverage that it enjoys today much less uh, than it enjoyed in the 1990s with trade leverage with financial leverage with military power you know i think that that you know, U.S. society looks a lot different. And, and to be honest, I'm sure that there are probably some people who would listen to this and say, well, that doesn't sound so bad. And there are probably aspects of it that aren't that bad, right? You probably do not see the same degree of outsourcing a manufacturer that you've seen. You certainly see a United States, which, which is, I think, overall poorer than the United States that we see today. I don't think you necessarily have one that is any politically more less partisan right Politi any, anything that's that's politically less difficult in the United States than you see today it's really hard for me to identify any specific part of the United States that's going to break away but you know you you just don't see the United States being the United States is not going to cease to be a pole and I really don't think that we're even going to see you know if the Soviet Union wins I don't even think the Soviet Union really becomes the hegemon I think it simply becomes sort of the premier power within a multipolar system that's also going to include places like Britain, Germany, France, Japan, China, and the United States, right? So that's really what I think defeat looks like for the United States in the Cold War is an end to U.S. primacy and then tons of follow-on effects that are going to just ripple across U.S. society and are going to ripple across the rest of Western society. You know, it's it's just hard for me to point, even in terms of like 1968, it's hard for me, me to point at any given time in which the U.S. political system, any given time in the Cold War, in which the U.S. political system looked fragile enough to fall apart. And, you know, I'll grant that in 1968, to people in 1968, it did kind of look pretty fragile, but it doesn't look fragile from our point of view. So, 
it's hard for me to see the United States ceasing to be the United States in its territorial existence. But I do see a big multipolar system if the Soviets win the Cold War. This would be a much different discussion 40 or 50 years ago, as you point out, because from the perspective of somebody in the 1960, in 1968, the Soviet Union has a completely united front, and it's easier to present that when the state controls the media versus, say, the United States when the bipartisan consensus on the Cold War, which was once pretty well held together, is coming apart, where you have war hawks and Curtis LeMays versus anti-war demonstrators and others turning into doves and with Vietnam being a major wedge issue. But returning to some of what you touched on with the Soviet Union, if it did continue to exist and evolve and survive and even thrive in the 21st century, what are some different scenarios that you could see? Maybe a best case and worst case scenario, like a best case, perhaps it's essentially occupying the role that China is occupying today and a worst case, who knows where that could go. You could take in all sorts of directions where essentially you have a Joseph Stalin, but with 21st century technology and control of social media and all the manipulation that you hear about with the aggressive forms of the Chinese credit score, forcing people into harsh lockdown during COVID and other things that the media have reported on. So what are some different scenarios that you could see on a still existent 21st century Soviet Union? That's a really interesting question. I I, I want to I want to step back because I think this is related. You know, it was it was really in the in the 1970s and even to some extent the early 1980s where it people in the United States really did kind of people who were paying attention did kind of start paying attention to the cracks in the Soviet system, right? To the major problems and especially the ethnic problems in the Soviet Union. And, you know, part of this was defectors, part of this was just better analysis. Uh, it's like, you know, this place is barely being whole, held together. We're not even sure if they realize how tenuous it is, but it's pretty tenuous. So, you know, I think we can imagine a lot of different scenarios in which the Soviet Union. So let's, I mean, just to take one, right? Let's take the Gorbachev scenario, right? Because Gorbachev never wanted the Soviet Union to collapse. That was not his intention, right? His intention was to revitalize the economy, to dial down tensions with the United States, which would allow him to reduce military spending, which would reinvest in the Soviet con- or in the civilian economy, and also hopefully to access as much Western technology as you could through the general reduction of tensions and, and making the Soviet Union a more investor-friendly place. Now, the problem with that was that the, the Soviet Union had to undergo this window of really severe vulnerability as it's going through this transitional period to a completely different kind of, of economic ordering and, and to some extent a different political ordering. And as we know from real history, it, it, it failed to make it through that window, right? It died like halfway through that window. So, you know, but if we envision one where, you know, okay, it kind of pulls it, it pulls it through, it manages to hold together, at least, it at least manages to hold together the Soviet Union parts of the Soviet Empire. I think that Eastern Europe is a, is maybe a little bit too much to imagine uh, the Soviets uh, continuing to hold on to, but maybe we can imagine one where Eastern Europe is not as hostile to the Soviet Union. You know, and then, you know, you can start seeing this Deng Xiaoping-esque China scenario in which the Soviet economy becomes more competitive, you know, in which it uses the benefit of its factor endowment, which is massive resources, especially energy resources. You know, it placates the problems of nationalists in the, in the Western territories of the Soviet Union. And from there, it's really hard to predict, right? Because, you know, however, pleasant Gorbachev may have been, this does not mean that Gorbachev is going to be replaced. I guess he's still not dead, right? So, you know, eventually Gorbachev is going to be replaced. Is he going to be replaced by someone as pleasant as he is, right? Because we know, as we know from China, just because you move partially down this road to opening does not mean you can't turn around, right? And so the Chinese have turned around pretty dramatically under Xi Jinping. And so you can imagine, even if Gorbachev succeeds in making the Soviet Union more cuddly, you can still imagine someone succeeding him and making it, you know, just bringing it back with sharper teeth. So that's that's one direction. I think another direction that people don't talk about, maybe this sort of, I, actually this problem you'd probably have to deal with either way, is that, you know, Russia-Chinese relations were pretty nasty all the way up until Gorbachev. And so one of the things I think you may be looking at if the Soviet Union survives is a maintenance of some pretty nasty Chinese-Soviet rivalry. I mean, this was 
I mean, the Chinese were investing in far right anti communist parties in Europe, right? They were basically sponsoring quasi Nazis to win elections in Europe because they were all, they were anti communist, but anti communist meant anti Russian, not anti Chinese. And so, you know, the fall of the Soviet Union really solves a lot of those problems. But if the Soviet Union survives, I think you still have the prospect for some pretty significant conflict between China and the Soviet Union. You know, I'm not, I don't, I'm, I'm of two minds on whether sort of the survived Soviet Union goes through the economic transition, probably one that is less dramatic than what Russia went through in the 1990s. But I still think there's going to be a lot of pain. I mean, the Chinese avoid this pain, frankly, because their economy is, is much less industrial and agriculturally developed in the 80s and 90s. And also opposition is far less developed. And so they can step on a lot of toes. And the Russians, the Soviets can't really do that in the same way. And so they're going to have a really tough time managing the transition to a more open economy. I think another issue here, maybe that we don't think of enough, but people certainly thought about in the 1980s, is that the rise of what we now call radical Islam was something that was happening alongside the Cold War, but it wasn't caused, it interacted with the Cold War in lots of ways, but fundamentally it was not caused by the Cold War, right? The United States took advantage of radical Islam and sort of radical, the radicalization of some Islamic populations in certain cases, the Soviets took advantage, but it's happening regardless of whether the Soviets or Americans are making it happen. And, you know, and, and fundamentally, the Soviet Union is at a much greater risk from radical Islam than the United States is, simply because of the fact that, you know, giant portions of the Soviet Union are Islamic, right? And even by the 1980s, those are the most demographically promising parts of the Soviet Union, are the ones that are producing the, the most babies, the most young people. And so, you know, from the Soviet point of view, from the Russian point of view, that's not a problem because they all get kicked out. I mean, it is kind of still a problem from the Russian point of view because there are lots of Russian parts or lots of Islamic parts of the Russian Federation. But it would have been a much bigger problem, I think, for the Soviets going into the 80s and the 1990s and the 2000s, dealing with you know a huge and very, very possibly radicalizing um, Islamic element within its own borders and that has lots of transnational connections that uh, could be really problematic. And one more point on this is that I think it's really, really difficult to look at to imagine a Soviet Union which um, which avoids the demographic catastrophe that Russia went through in the 1990s and the 2000s, which is to say the just the absolute collapse of birth rates and the substantial increase in death rates. You know, I don't think it necessarily had to be as bad as it was, but pretty much every Eastern European country went through the same thing, even ones that really restored their economies pretty quickly. So Poland, uh, Slovakia, and other countries where you, you get the economic system back pretty rapidly and you get a stable political system, but they still go through this demographic catastrophe. Um, and the Chinese are going through this demographic catastrophe right now. And so I think it would have been a real challenge for Soviet society in the 1990s and the early aughts. You know, what do you do when people just aren't having babies anymore and yet they continue to drink vodka and you continue to have these lifespan problems? What does that do? to this, you know, extremely generous social welfare system that you developed under the Soviet Union and that maybe is surviving reforms and maybe not. I think that's a real big problem for the Soviets. And I don't think there's been enough attention to, you know, how the Soviets go through that, even if Gorbachev manages to survive, and even if the Soviet Union manages to survive, how do they go through this pretty big problem that they need to deal with? That's, that's just you know, that's at the, the light at the end of the tunnel. It's an oncoming train with respect to the demographic future of Russians. Hey, everyone. Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. It's hard to argue that demographics aren't destiny, to be sure. Well, this uh, was a really useful thought exercise. But from your standpoint, what do you think are the best lessons to take away from this? Some might think that the superiority of Western liberal democracy is self-evident. Any system that would set itself up to oppose it has its own seeds of destruction. Like uh, J.R.R. Tolkien said, oft evil will shall evil mar. 
And that worrying about a Soviet takeover only resulted in some panic porn that we laugh at today, like Red Dawn in the 80s or books like The Late Great Planet Earth that theologically argue that the end times are near because of Soviet nuclear confrontation and interpreting different scriptures along these lines. Or is the takeaway that there were smart policy choices that were made, things like promoting democracy, Radio Free America, different types of investments to support different types of democracies and counter communist takeovers around the world. And those policies that work should be studied and continue to be implemented into the 21st century. What is your take on the lessons from looking at the results of the Cold War? So, I mean, I think I think that my big takeaway, and I think about this a lot with respect to People's Republic of China, with respect to North Korea, with respect to Russia right now, is that the things that we emphasize during the Cold War, and which are a lot of the things you just said, right? Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, you know, focus on human rights, Helsinki Accords, et cetera, et cetera. You know, a lot of those were a lot less important to the death of the Soviet Union than we think. That, you know, the death of the Soviet Union, you know, the Soviet Union died because of a combination of the economics, the military vulnerability, and the fact that it was a multinational empire that wasn't well set up, did not have political institutions that were well set up to be a multinational empire. You know, you look, you look at North Korea, you look at China, you look at Russia today, and people ask, well, how, you know, are they just not getting the news? It's like, they just don't want the news, right? You know, in Russia right now, there's no, you can, five minutes, less than five minutes, you can get any amount of information about uh, the war in Ukraine that you want. And yet the dominant media sources are the ones that people rely upon because they'd, they'd rather not deal with the fact that they're engaging in this horrific invasion of a neighboring country. And you see similar dynamics in North Korea, where like half the population has cell phones that, that can reach the outside world. So it's not like they don't know what the outside world is like. They just have to go along with their lives inside their country. And the same thing with China, where you know if you, if you irritate Chinese netizens, they'll just come after you on Twitter, right? Which is something that didn't really happen during the Cold War, because we always imagined that, that they were so restricted, they didn't get any, any information. Like they can have any information that they want. So it's, it's not the control over information that, that's really absolutely critical. It's more of these fundamental military, economic, and imperial governance issues that made the Soviet Union simply untenable when the 1990s rolled around. Well, this is an important subject to look at, and it's one of the great what-ifs of history, especially in the 20th century. And I think there are a lot of things to consider as we look forward and many lessons to draw from here. And we're only able to scratch the surface, but there is a lot more that you have written on. And can you tell listeners where they can find you online and any recent book projects you have? Yeah, so you can find, I, I'm, I'm a senior editor at the uh, blog Lawyers, Guns, and Money, which just do a search for Lawyers, Guns, and Money, and you'll find the blog. It's one of the longest running blogs, well, longest surviving blogs now on the internet. I'm a contributing editor at the website 1945, where... Lately, it's been a lot of Russia-Ukraine stuff, but it's just general security type type issues. You know, I have three books, which are you know a book on the Air Force, a book on battleships, and most recently a book called Patents for Power, which is about intellectual property law and military technology. So, if you're interested, in that has a lot of USSR content that's pretty similar to to what we just discussed with respect to the technology part. You know, in the future, I'm working on a book on finance and a book on space force, but. If you want to read anything I'm producing right now, Lawyers, Guns, and Money, or 1945 would be the places to go. Great. We'll link those in the show notes. Robert, thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's been an honor to be here. All right. That is it for today. If you would like to see show notes for this episode, along with all my others, go to ParthenonPodcast.com. That's the name of the podcast network that I'm a part of, along with James Early's Key Battles of American History, Steve Guerra's Beyond the Big Screen and History of the Papacy, and other great history shows as well. If you'd like to support History Unplugged, the two easiest ways to do so are to subscribe to the show on the podcast player of your choice and leave a review. The second way is to join our membership program. And if you do so, you'll get completely ad-free episodes of the entire back catalog, which is 600 episodes and growing. Just go to patreon.com slash unplugged. 